the Burj Khalifa is not just a stupendously huge phallic testament to the fact that money can indeed buy you anything, it is also the world's largest sand castle. Of the 300,000 cubic meters of concrete that were used for its construction, roughly three quarters are sand, that's quite a lot. Alright, you might say, no problem, Dubai might lack genuine freedom of press and not everyone there has human rights, but at least they have sand in abundance, right? Well, not exactly. Dubai has plenty of desert sand, which is nice and round and thus totally unfit for concrete production. Therefore, the city had to import the sand for the Burj Khalifa from Australia. The explanation for why they had to do this leads us right into one of the largest, mostly unknown crises of our time, the sand crisis. Before we get into the juicy environment threatening stuff, let's get some of the technicalities out of the way. When you hear the word sand, you might think of something that looks like this, but in fact, sand is not defined by its material, but by its size. So everything that measures between 0.06 and 2 mm is technically speaking sand. It can be composed of minerals, organic material or rock fragments and it also comes in different shapes. Like I said before, desert sand is shaped by wind and thus very round, whereas sand shaped by water is usually rougher and has jagged edges which makes it perfect for concrete production. And so, even while there is plenty of desert sand lying around, for example in Dubai, most of the sand we use comes from coastlines, riverbanks and quarries. And oh boy do we use a lot of sand! Here is a long yet non-exhaustive list of things for which sand is a key ingredient. Concrete, asphalt and these two alone already include most buildings and road infrastructure. Furthermore, we have glass, electronics, chemical production, water filtration, detergents, cosmetics, toothpaste, solar panels and, although that might not apply to you personally, land reclamation projects and beach renourishment programs. So, like I said, quite impressive for such little grains. Let's talk some numbers. How much sand exactly do we use? Well, unfortunately, we don't know. You see, in most regions, sand is a common pool resource, that is, a resource that is open to all because the access to it cannot realistically be limited. There are few monitoring programs for sand mining and many mining sites like rivers are remote and span several countries, which makes it difficult to report and enforce regulations. As a result, most sand mining and trade is in fact undocumented. The best way to estimate global sand use is to measure it indirectly using a correlation between the use of sand and cement for which we have better data. It is estimated that the global use of sand and gravel is roughly 10 times higher than that of cement and so a UN report from 2019 estimates that we now need 50 billion tons of sand each year. According to the same UN report, this makes sand and gravel the second largest resources extracted and traded by volume after water. And just to be clear, the demand for sand is unlikely to slow down in the next few years as especially Asia and the Pacific region have an increasing demand for construction material. In conclusion, sand is one of the most important resources on earth, yet in many regions sand mining and trade are largely unchecked. Our demand for sand is already higher than the amount of sand that can be produced responsibly and sustainably, yet there is a lot of money to be made with sand. And wherever there is a lot of money involved, things tend to get interesting. This is where the juicy environment threatening part begins. Look, sand mining isn't in itself a problem. It becomes problematic though when it happens unregulated, often illegally and at a scale that has to satisfy the global need for 50 billion tons per year. Or maybe even more, we don't know, that's also part of the problem. For most usages we need marine and coastal sand, thus sand mining usually takes the form of ships sucking up all the sand from the bottom of rivers or the sea. This destroys the habitat of all aquatic life that lives down there, such as corals and seaweeds, and disturbs the balance of the existing natural environment, which leads to a loss in biodiversity. The churned up sediment also clouds the water, which kills the underwater vegetation and subsequently the fish that feed on it. Extensive sand mining can also lead to shoreline and river erosion. When the sand is taken away, other sand slides in and, in turn, the beaches may slide down. One consequence of this is that coastal life and agriculture might be damaged. Another and probably even more detrimental consequence is that we are destroying our safety barrier against natural hazards and the rising sea levels. 
Instability of riverbanks and coastlines leads to increased flood frequency and intensity as well as to a decreased protection against storms, tsunamis and wave events. Other consequences can be seen at Poyang Lake. It is not just the largest freshwater lake in China, it is also the biggest sand mine on the planet with roughly 235 million cubic meters of sand taken from it each year. Over the years, this has led to a drastic lowering of the water level, a decline in water quality and threatening conditions for both the humans as well as the endangered animals living there. Or to take another, even more extreme example, when Singapore needed sand to artificially enhance its landmass, they imported the sand from Indonesia. The enormous sand extraction in the sea around Indonesia has created sandslides which have led to the erasure of more than 20 Indonesian islands since 2005. As a consequence, Indonesia and several other countries have banned the export of sand, but such measures have created another problem – illegal sand trade. By now, we have exceeded most of the easily available sand resources. But as the demand for sand is continually on the rise, whole criminal organizations have formed that concentrate on illegally mining and trading sand. India, for example, made headlines for its sand mafia, which is considered to be one of the most powerful and violent organized crime groups in the world. Sand trade is by now such a profitable business that these gangs are ready to kill for it. According to a report from 2018, illegal sand extraction might in fact be the third most profitable crime in the world, surpassed only by product piracy and drug trafficking. Alright, so much for the problem, let's think about possible solutions and next steps. The number one thing we need right now is more information. It is embarrassing how little we know about one of the most important resources on Earth. We need more data on the sand resource flows. Where does it come from, where does it go to and how much sand do we actually consume? Also, studying local environments to define the limits of acceptable change can tell us more about the true global costs of sand mining. We also need more transparency and accountability. As the previously cited UN report concludes, there is currently no international body with a mandate to mediate differing interests on sand resources. Ideally, we should establish an international or multilateral framework to regulate and monitor sand mining activities. Such a global program could gather and share data as well as implement best practices and policies, yet this only works when the local stakeholders, NGOs and governments work together. There are currently no alternative materials that could satisfy the ever-increasing demand for sand. There are some substitutes like crushed rock, fly ash or quarry dust, yet the building industry is quite conservative and none of these materials offers a short-term remedy. So, for now, we should concentrate on using less sand. Some European cities, like Zurich for example, already built most of their buildings with almost 100% recycled concrete. We also should use the existing infrastructure longer by retrofitting instead of replacing it. And the concrete we do use should be optimized to increase its efficiency and lifespan. In any case, we need more public awareness. Sand is a limited resource and we should treat it accordingly. So, from now on, if you think of the sand crisis every time you see the Burj Khalifa, maybe the sand wasn't completely wasted on its construction after all. <laughs>